Hello, this is Professor Keith Ross from the John Jay College of Criminal Justice. This lecture is for Introduction to Criminal Investigation, and this is going to be Chapter 1. Um, for those of you that are following along on the PowerPoint, I'm actually starting at slide number 9. Everything else was sort of basically pictures that without any context, aren't really gonna make much sense. It would be better if I could show it to you in a classroom, but regardless. Uh, so for those of you that remember that very first day, I had asked who wants to be a police officer and there were a few hands that got raised. And for you know some people, maybe they grew up in a quote unquote cop family, so they were exposed to it that way. Uh, some of you, watched TV shows and fell in love with law enforcement, and this is the path that you have chosen for yourself, and it's totally understood. But for most people, when they think about becoming a police officer, it's usually not that they wanna be a uniformed police officer, but what they wanna be is a detective, because normally, at least in the media, detectives are always sort of highlighted. They, they're glamorous, they're smart, sometimes they're snarky, all of this kind of stuff. So, slide number nine. So you want to be a detective? Well, the hard truth about it is that no one walks out of the police academy as a detective, no matter where you are. Could be in New York, could be in Boston, LA, it could be in another country, Tokyo, uh, Shanghai, doesn't matter. You sort of have to, quote unquote, make your bones and you sort of have to learn how to be a police officer first before you can be an investigator or a detective. The investigative track. So what we're talking about here is, well, how does a police officer become a detective? Now, in some departments, that's considered to be an actual promotion. Uh, in the NYPD, it is not really a promotion in the way that going from a police officer to a sergeant is. It's sort of considered a lateral transfer, although detectives do make more money than police officers, and they do a very different thing than what uniform police officers do. Uniform police officers, for the most part, conduct patrol. And when we're talking about patrol, they conduct investigations too, but they don't conduct the same type of investigations that a detective does two very different things. So what happens is, let's say there is a police officer, he or she has graduated out of the academy. Well, they have aspirations of becoming a detective. So at least in the NYPD, well, how do you do it? Well, you can't be lazy about it. You have to be proactive. You have to be out there interacting with citizens, affecting arrests when need be, and making sure that the arrests are good arrests, and when we say good arrests, one, that they're based on good faith, and two, that they are based on probable cause, something that we had talked about in that last chapter, probable cause. An offense has been committed, and the person who is about to be arrested is the one that probably did it. Do we 100% need to know on the patrol level that this person committed this offense? The answer to that is no. Would a reasonable person looking at the facts at the time the incident took place, would they think an offense has been committed? If so, that is probable cause. So that's what patrol does. Detectives do something very different because they're going to be the ones that are going to be testifying at trials. Now, if we're talking about criminal trials, the standard of proof necessary to gain a conviction in a criminal trial is beyond a reasonable doubt. A much higher standard than prob probable cause. Probable cause, person probably did it. Beyond a reasonable doubt, the person did do it and the evidence shows as such. So this uniformed police officer is rocking and rolling, doing what he or she does, making a lot of arrests, and then maybe what they do is they put in for what's called a plain clothes assignment. Now, in today's climate right now, there aren't too many plain clothes investigative assignments. I think that is a trend that will turn around very soon, especially with the crime spikes in these major urban areas. They're going to need some sort of plain clothes to 
plainclothes officers to conduct these types of investigations. So in the PowerPoint, they talk about anti-crime, and as I said, at least in the NYPD as of right now, and uh, anti-crime was disbanded, was brought back, but now they are in uniform. Uh, my, my belief is that they will be back plain clothes fairly soon. Depends, but it depends on elections, politics, procedures, all of that, but be that as it may. Usually what happens then is that let's say plainclothes police officer has done a good job in his or her assignment. They will then get asked, at least in the NYPD, to go, quote unquote, upstairs. What that means is that what they're going to do as a white shield is that they're going to start working in the detective bureau. Now, if they conduct investigations, detective type investigations, deep investigations, and they do that for 18 months consecutively. So it has to be 18 months, day in, day out, day in, day out. If you do it for 17 months, something happens, and you don't, you go back downstairs, well, you'd have to go back upstairs and redo that 18 months. But if after 18 months in a detective bureau, or some type of investigative track, narcotics, vice, things of that nature, what will happen is you will go and you will get, quote unquote, promoted to detective. Now, again, it's not really a promotion. It's not a supervisory type promotion, but even that is a gray area. Because when we're talking about crime scenes, a detective is the one who is in charge of that crime scene, no matter what rank is there. Although in the real world, if we have someone of a high rank, that detective is going to extend whatever courtesies to, uh, to whoever who the higher rank is. Qualities of an investigator. Now, for these PowerPoints, there's lots of acronyms. I don't really think you need to know all of them. If it's an acronym I want you to know, I will definitely point it out. So the most important qualities of an investigator is to be a PD cop, sort of clever, PD police department cop. You need to be persistent. You can ask a person a question, but a persistent person will continue to ask that same question. Maybe they rephrase it a couple of different ways. And there's a reason why you would do that, because what do you want to see? Do you want to see if someone is eliciting truthful statements or deceitful statements? Determined, meaning what you're looking to do is you're looking to close out this case completely. So if we have a crime victim, a victim of robbery, well, what a detective does is that they investigate that. And if the person who has been accused of this offense decides to go to the trial, that detective is going to be investigating any and every possible lead to make sure that the person who committed that offense serves justice, meaning in this case to be convicted of that felony. A communicator. One of the things that when people really think of police, they tend to think of arrests, they tend to think of summonses, but really that's not what police do. It's part of the job, but really at least definitely on the patrol level and definitely on the detective level, you need to be able to interact with people. You need to make people, you need to bring people that are in crisis down and you need to be able to Give a person a sense of trust so that they will talk to you and that the more that they talk to you, the better information that you get. Now, the great communicators, especially when we're talking about investigations, there's usually two types of questions. There are open questions and, a close, and closed questions. A closed question is a question that can be answered yes or no. Is it sunny out today? The answer to that is either yes or no. But... If you ask, well, what's the weather like today? Well, now that person has to relay a story. Well, you know what? It's sunny out, but it's pretty cool out. It's almost autumn. So what you're doing is this person is sort of explaining their answer because you've asked a question that can't be answered yes or no. And when that person starts explaining, the best communicators are doing two things at the same time. They're listening intently, and they're also thinking about follow-up questions. Being oriented towards the details. 
especially when we're talking about crime scenes, what we're looking for is we're looking for evidence, no matter how that evidence is, whether it's physical evidence, serological or fluid type evidence, testimonial evidence, you don't want to discount anything. So you want to pay attention to the details. As a matter of fact, sort of when I think of the word investigation, it's an observation that brings you, excuse me, it's observing the bigger picture, then starting to make a determination as to what things are quote unquote probative, meaning that they are crucial to my case and what are things that aren't crucial to my case. And then from that to make a determination as to how does this piece of evidence fit in this bigger puzzle? So that's that attention to details and you have to be prepared. You have to be prepared to be a fairly good writer, a fairly good communicator, and to be able to explain any evidence that you recovered from the scene. What's its piece in the scene? What's its part in the scene? Why did I, why did I include that? Well, it ties a person to the scene, something to that effect. I am on slide number 11. Invest investigators will have to overcome many obstacles to solve the case. This is not television. You can't give up. Victims and their families are counting on you. When we're talking about the criminal justice system and we're talking about criminal trials, usually what we think about is we think about, especially in trial, that there's a prosecutor representing the state and then there's the defendant, the one accused of this offense. But really, the truth of the matter is, 99% of the time, the, un, the sort of forgotten voice, a lot of times, is the victim. So what detectives do is that they, they sort of advocate in their own ways to victims' families so that the victims receive some type of justice, some type of closure. But again, there is many obstacles. One of the things is having uncooperative witnesses, uncooperative victims, uncooperative perpetrators. And doesn't mean that they have to be uncooperative at the scene. Maybe at the scene they've elicited a statement, but then they've had a couple of weeks to think about it uh, and they decide that they don't want to be uncooperative. This is really, you'll see a lot of this in domestic violence cases where a person calls the police against someone else, and then they've had a, you know, a couple of weeks goes by, and then they have a change of heart. Even if they have a change of heart and they decide to drop charges, the district attorney or the prosecutor has the power, has the ability to move forward with the case, because instead of representing just the victim, they're representing the people of the state of, at least here, New York. Demanding supervisors. One of the things, one of the pressures is that a detective has a case. Well, supervisors want to see that the detectives are investigating that case and probably more importantly, that they're closing cases because cases, depending on the command or precinct that you work in, can mount very, very quickly. Um, An inquisitive media, there's really nothing I have to say more than that. Uh, it, it is a known fact that people in the media they monitor police frequencies. So if you've ever wondered, how does the media get there before the police does? It's because they're monitoring these frequencies. So they hear what's going on. They hear exactly what the police are hearing. And you know, there are, there are apps on your phones if you, were, if you were so inclined that you would be able to listen to these frequencies as well. And also lack of physical evidence. Either the lack of physical evidence or the tainting of physical evidence. Because you could have, let's say, a firearm in, a, let's say, a murder scene. One of the things that a good investigator is going to have to figure out is how many people touched that firearm? Now, let's say I'm a police officer guarding this crime scene and I pick up this firearm. I need to tell that detective that I picked up that firearm because what's going to happen is my prints are going to be lifted off that firearm. I am going to have to get my I'm going to have to be re-fingerprinted so that they can exclude me, you know, due to some sort of human error. Don't lose focus, keep on digging for clues. Just because you've interviewed a victim, just because you've interviewed a witness does not mean that's it. 
you're going to want to re-interview them because if you're detail-oriented and you're persistent, you're going to start looking at things and you're going to probably come up with more questions. The more questions that you have, the more answers you're going to want. So this would be the case as to why you want to interview and re-interview people. Confer with the police labs. Police labs do all sorts of different testing, obviously ballistic testing. And when we're talking about ballistic testing, we're talking about firearms. Is the firearm operable? Uh, what type of cartridges or what most people say bullets were ejected from that firearm? What was the spin? What is the velocity? Things of that nature. But it, it can also be serological. Blood could be saliva, could be semen, could be vaginal fluid, things like that. Uh, review case files, evidence logs, and reports. One of the things a great investigator is always asking himself or herself is, did I miss something? And if you have a partner, you can let them look at the case and say, is there anything, is there anything that you see here that maybe I didn't check off? Is there something here that you think I'm missing? Rattle off ideas with your partners. Rattle off ideas with your supervisors. Because again, what are we doing? We're representing victims' interests here. As a communicator, a majority of the investigator's time is spent talking with people. The better that you can talk with people, the better you're communicating and the more information that you're getting. And that's really the goal of what a detective does when he or she is conducting interviews. It's not really to talk. It's to gather data. It's to gather information. Finessing information from people that may not be willing to do so. Again, one of the things that you're going to have to do is to put a person at ease, especially when we're talking, you know, at the scene of an offense, at the scene of a crime. This is a person, if we're talking about, let's say, a victim, a witness, maybe a, a victim's family member, they are in crisis. They're quite agitated. They're emotional. What a detective wants to do is to try and start here's the big word, de-escalating that person to sort of bring them down because we don't want people eliciting responses that are highly emotional. We'd rather them issue more rational responses because more rational responses are going to hold up better in court. Asking the right question can mean all the difference in the world. What communicators do is that they build a rapport. They build relationships with people, no matter how long that relationship is. It could be a five-minute relationship. It could be months long, could be years long, depending on what the case is. But that's what communicators do. In orienting towards the detail, little things solve crimes. Um, and little things can toss out crimes. I think I've mentioned this in the Zoom class. In the O.J. Simpson criminal trial, what was the one piece of evidence that got O.J. Simpson his acquittal? It was the glove, because if it don't fit, you must acquit. What is out of the or ordinary was anything obviously moved, especially when we're talking about homicide type scenes. Was the body moved? And if so, we have to figure out who did it, why did they do it, how did they do it, where was the body originally, where was it moved to? Was this the only place it was moved to? Again, this one, this one little fact can spring off 10, 15 questions. <clears throat> Being prepared. Investigators must be aware of each and every detail. We've sort of covered that. How else would you know what questions to ask your suspect? So if you are conducting a quote-unquote interrogation, meaning that the person is in custody and we're asking about specific acts of criminality, we want to sort of have an idea of what those answers are going to be. And the way we did that is we've conducted investigation so that when we go into that room, we're not surprised by what we're going to hear. Reports must be typed, submitted for approval in a timely fashion and be neatly indexed in the case folder. One of the things about uh, police work is that if it's not written down, it did not happen. So there has to always be a written record of everything a detective does. So if a detective goes out to canvas to look for witnesses, that must be documented on a piece of paper. Things that we're going to be documenting is what day, what time, where did they go? What did they look at? Did they recover anything? Did they not recover anything? 
things of that nature. Did they make a phone call to a victim? When, when did they do it? Where did they do it? What was said in, you know, sort of substantively, it doesn't have to be word for word, but I want to have a pretty good idea when I'm thumbing through that case, what my detective has done. What is a criminal investigation? Criminal investigation is the process by which an investigator collects evidence. This could be testimonial evidence, meaning interviews with people, could be physical evidence, things of that nature, organizes, re uh, records everything he or she has done, he what he or she has seen, and evaluates the evidence and information. Even if I have a piece of information, and let's say uh, I have a victim and they tell me something that right now doesn't fit with my case, I still want to record it. Because maybe down the line, maybe now I've made some sort of tie between some piece of evidence that I've recovered at a later date to this statement. So it's sort of these two things will start supporting each other. <clears throat> I'm skipping to chapter, uh, excuse me, slide number 17. Note the investigation doesn't end with an arrest. Now, more detectives do make arrests. But a lot of times the way that they make, the way they get cases is that patrol affects the arrest. And then what happens is detectives start conducting investigations. This is definitely going to happen with felonies, especially violent type felonies uh, and maybe some type of misdemeanors. I, I would think domestic violence misdemeanors definitely just off the top of my head. Uh, so. When we're conducting an investigation, and this is something I would definitely write down, no matter what I'm investigating, whether I'm investigating a noise complaint or whether I'm investigating a homicide, the same questions are going to be asked, whether it's a noise complaint or whether it's a homicide type investigation. And these uh, questions are called Neotwi questions. N-E-O-T-W-Y. I know you've never heard this word before in it, but it's an acronym and it's sort of an easy way to sort of remember it. So N, when did it happen? E, where did it happen? The O, who did it happen to? Who did it? Who else might have seen it? The T, what happened? The W, how did it happen? And the why is something that detectives always look for. What the why is, is detectives will try to figure out the motive of the perpetrator of this offense. Another term for motive is modus operandi. They all mean sort of the same thing. What is the motive? Well, it's why, why did this person commit this offense? Investigators must follow the case through from arrest now, remember the legal standard of proof for an arrest, probable cause, to a successful prosecution. When we talk about successful prosecution, we are talking about getting a verdict of guilty, either from a jury of 12 and or a judge. So that standard of proof, that legal standard of proof to gain that guilty verdict is beyond a reasonable doubt. The goals of investigation are DOA, sort of a terrible joke. But the D, determine whether a crime was committed. Now, I've been using the term offense. Now I'm going to start using the term crime. For those of you that watch the intro to Law and Justice, how do we define what a crime is? Crime is not every offense. A crime are two specific types of offenses, either misdemeanors and or felonies. Obtain information and evidence to identify perpetrators and arrest suspects and present the case for a prosecution. Slide number 19, determine whether a crime has been committed. Crime is an act, commission or omission forbidden by the law and punishable by a fine, imprisonment, or even death. Now, some misdemeanors, you could be sentenced to a fine, sort of rare, but could happen. But there are two categories of crimes. I just said that. Misdemeanors, what is a misdemeanor? The general term of a misdemeanor is that if you are convicted of a misdemeanor, you will serve at a minimum 16 days up to one year in a city or county jail. The other one is felonies. 
felonies, the minimum sentence you could serve for a felony if you're convicted of a felony is one year plus one day. Could be higher than that, could be sentenced to death, but at minimum, one year plus one day. And if you are sentenced to one year plus day, uh, one day, three years, life imprisonment, you will serve that at a state prison. So misdemeanor, city, county, jail, prisons, state prison, uh, excuse me, felonies, uh, state prisons. Does the evidence spell out a crime? Not every incident will be a crime. Violations for one, uh, traffic infractions. And if you remember, for those of you that got this wrong on that quiz, uh, violations and traffic infractions, that category is called petty offenses. <clears throat> I am going to skip to slide number 21. Obtaining information and evidence to identify perpetrators. The investigator searches for the following. Trace evidence. Now it's sort of, you could sort of figure out what trace evidence is. Trace evidence is very small type evidence. Things that might, might be missed by just a quick glance. Hair fibers, maybe skin cells, um, maybe fabric. Uh, like pieces or threads of fabric, rugs, things of that nature. When, you're pr when you are investigating a crime scene, you can't discount everything. And again, if details matter, sometimes details are very small. Sometimes they're glaring, but sometimes they're very small. So it's one thing to see this bigger picture. It's another thing to take that big picture and start sharpening the focus and making it smaller and smaller to its component parts. Body fluids, I've already sort of mentioned that. Fingerprints, loops, arches, and whirls, we'll get into that in a later lesson. But one of the things about fingerprints is that very, uh, it is possible for a person to be born with the same exact fingerprints as another person in the world. I believe that's called a chimera, and I think the odds of that are probably like one in 40 billion. So it is possible that it could happen. However, it is mathematically highly improbable. Even identical twins, they share the same DNA profile, but they do not share the same fingerprints. They have very uh, similar fingerprints, but there are noted differences. And again, in a later lesson, when we start talking about evidence, I'll show you how to actually, on the PowerPoint, how to sort of make these point matches between a print lifted from a scene and a print that I know who it's coming from. In addition, eyewitness identifications play a pivotal role in identifying suspects. And one of the things that investigators do know is that time is of the essence when we're talking about eyewitness testimony, because as soon as someone sees something, they start forgetting it. And another thing, if I have more than one eyewitness to a scene, what do I want to do? Well, I want to separate them because I want to get each of their stories. I'm not expecting the same exact story from two or three people. If I got the same exact story, I would probably think that there is some type of collusion. But I'm going to expect that if they're honest people, that there are going to be lots and lots of similarities so that the two or three narratives make sense with each other. Maybe one person had a different vantage point than the other. And computer checks. Now, this says both law enforcement checks and private checks. Now, law enforcement checks are obviously private databases that only law enforcement can sort of uh, go through. DMV, uh, the New York State Department of Motor Vehicles, your driver's license, is a private sort of database that law enforcement can access. There, there's e-justice, NCIS, things of that nature. But a good investigator is not only just going to check them, but they're going to Google as well, because most people have social media networks, fairly easy to find that stuff out. And if you're wondering about it, Google your name and see what pops up. Probably more information than you expected to see. Arresting suspects and presenting the case for prosecution. The ultimate goal of every investigation is to make an arrest and to have that arrest successfully prosecuted. An arrest is a seizure under the Fourth Amendment. We talked about that, uh, with the exception of CAPS. Committed in the officer's present, uh, presence, arrest warrants, probable cause, and statutory. We'll get into this stuff a little bit later, but one of the things that usually city and county and state police officers have, 
they can arrest without warrants. Now, my understanding is uh, federal agencies, let's say the FBI, they don't arrest without a warrant. They must procure a warrant first. However, more often than not, when they get a warrant, it, they could be going after a single person, but a lot of times what they're doing is they're going through an organization. Uh, so we'll talk about warrants in another chapter, but basically what is a warrant? Usually what a warrant is that a person did not appear in court and it's a judicial order to go get that person. Committed in the officer's presence. When a crime occurs in front of the officer, they can make the arrest. No warrant is needed. This is known as a pickup arrest. So if I'm walking my foot post and I see a perpetrator, let's say rob somebody, and I run after them and I catch them, I don't need to get a warrant first to arrest them. I can arrest them because I had probable cause. Arrest warrants, what, I, what did I just say? Signed by a judge after, after an affidavit, a sworn statement from a police officer that the information that that police officer is giving to the judge is true to the best of their knowledge and was given in good faith. That's a clue for at least one of my classes, not yours though. The warrant states the name of the person to be seized, arrested, and what court they are to be presented in front of. Maybe New York City Criminal Court, maybe New York State Supreme Court, maybe New York City, uh, New York State Family Court. Executable at any time, but be careful. Arrest warrants come with an absolute right to counsel. We'll talk a little bit, a bit about that in a later chapter, but what the absolute right to counsel is, if a person... If there's an arrest warrant for a person, that means that that person was arrested. They went to a judge. They were arraigned, meaning that they know the charges being leveled against them. Let's say they were re released on their own recognizance to appear at court at a later date. At that later date, the person does not show. If they don't show, this arrest warrant will be executed. Now, when a person is arraigned and they're hearing the charges being leveled against them, they have counsel, either a private counsel that they've retained or one that was appointed to them by the courts at no cost to them. As soon as they have counsel, if I, let's say, am executing an arrest warrant, I can arrest this person, but I can't ask interrogatory questions without their counsel being present. Even if this person says, I hated that lawyer, I'll tell you anything you want. I don't want him or her in my presence. They were idiots. Does not matter. I cannot interrogate. I cannot ask about specific criminality. If I have them in custody without their counsel being present. Now, once the counsel shows, if the person who was, who was, the na was named on this arrest warrant says, I don't want him or her to represent me anymore, well, then... They're, they are declining their absolute right to counsel. And now then they could either ask for another lawyer or they could say, officer, I'm going to tell you everything. Then any statements that they make after Miranda has been read, I can record and I can use that against them. <clears throat> I am at chapter 25. Now, chapter 25, in a later chapter, I'm going to do a, a whole lesson on a New York State case called People versus DeBoer. On this PowerPoint, there is a mistake. So I'm gonna point it out to you and I'm gonna ask you to cross it out. So there are four levels of suspicion that dictate police public encounters, also known as the levels of, suspi of suspicion, sometimes also referred to as levels of knowledge. There is one, le level one, request for information. Level two, that, that's where the mistake is. So do me a favor, cross out mere suspicion. We're not going to use that term. The term that we're going to use is a the term that we're going to use is common law right of inquiry. So level one, mere suspicion. Level two, common law right of inquiry. What I want you guys to do right now is to just bracket these two and just write non-custodial. I'm not explaining any more than that right now. Level three, reasonable suspicion, and level four, probable cause. You can bracket those two together and write custodial. And again, at a later date, we will go all through 
people versus DeBoer, you will understand it. So I'm going to skip these next ones because I want to really talk about it more. So let's go to chapter 31, functions of evidence. Evidence is either inculpatory or exculpatory. These are two very good terms to know. These are two very testable terms to know. Inculpatory, evidence that shows involvement and tends to establish guilt. So inculpatory evidence shows that a person is guilty of the offense that they have been accused of. Exculpatory is the exact opposite of that. Evidence that can either exonerate or eliminate a suspect. So this is evidence that tends to show that a person was not guilty of the offense being accused of. Uh, I will skip to slide number 33, types of evidence. There are many different types of evidence encountered or used during a criminal investigation and subsequent trial. Without evidence, there is no case. Latest stats from the Innocence Project, and you can Google what the Innocent, Innocence Project does. National or organization dedicated to helping wrongfully convicted states that 70% of exonerations, meaning overturning a verdict, comes through DNA evidence because they were misidentifications from eyewitness testimony. Now, DNA, again, we'll talk about it at a later date. What is DNA? DNA is deoxyribonucleic acid, basically the chemical blueprint of life. DNA is what makes us who we are. Whether we have brown hair, blonde hair, blue eyes, brown eyes, right-handed, left-handed, artistic, logical, things of that nature. Direct evidence, testable con concept, evidence that demonstrates a fact. No inferences or presumptions are necessary. Examples, eyewitness testimony direct evidence. Yes, that is the person that stole my cell phone. Video surveillance footage. Absolutely. Well, that shows directly that a person committed or did not commit an offense. And one of the things that we would want to do with uh, video evidence is to forensically authenticate that evidence, which is why I caution all of my students when you see these YouTube videos, you can make an opinion, but don't make that your final opinion, because there is oh, where there's one video, at least in today's day and age, there's another 20. And those 20, other 20 can show differences from that very first video. Victim and witness statements. Slide 35, real evidence, more commonly known as physical evidence. Now, if you remember an in introduction to law and justice, when we were talking about the pretrial or suppression hearings, one of those hearings are called MAP hearings, based on MAP versus Ohio. Well, what, what, do, what do MAP hearings examine? Physical evidence, anything that has physical prop properties that can be seen, touched, and collected. Examples, biological fluid, bite marks, ballistics, soil, shoe impressions, fingerprints, things of that nature. Trace evidence is a subset of real evidence. It is microscopic evidence or really, really small evidence that at quick glance, you would miss. So microscopic evidence such as skin, hair, fibers, pollen, paint, glass, gunshot residue, etc., can be easily transferred from suspect to victim or vice versa. One of the things that I, I like talking about is if you shake hands, well, on my hand has skin cells, has dead skin cells. The dead skin cells that were on this hand were transferred to this hand. Now this hand has dead skin cells. Those dead skin cells from this hand were transferred to this hand. Not visible by the naked eye, but I as a good investigator following low cards principles understands that it's there and I have to search it out. Trace evidence is subject to loss or destruction if, not, if proper precautions are not taken. The corpus delecti, Latin for body of the crime, does not mean a physical body. It is a set of standards. It is evidence that establishes that a crime actually occurs. I'll probably talk about this later, but a corpus delecti has a couple of things in it. It has that there is a statute, that there is a law prohibiting such conduct. There is the actus rea, meaning that the act actually took place. It wasn't something that I thought about. I didn't think about killing my professor just as a random thought. 
I actually did it. Well, that would be the actus rea. Then there is the mens rea, meaning the mental state or the culpable mental state, uh, the culpable mental state that I had at the time that I committed this actus rea. Uh, the result, was there an injury? Either was I physically injured, emotionally injured, uh, was property damage? And what is the causal relationship between the actus rea, the mens rea, and the result. Digital evidence, which is often referred to as electronic evidence, is becoming one of the most important types of evidence in smart in criminal investigations. Smartphones. Smart, if you have a smartphone, and I can't imagine any one of my students that don't, well, your smartphone tells me where you are every second of the day. It's just up to me to access that information to find out. Computers, tablets, iPads, email, internet records, social media are more pervasive than ever. Digital evidence is not just for financial crimes anymore, especially when we're talking about, let's say, gang-related offenses. More often than not, once a gang member has perpetrated an offense, they're going to go directly on their social media. Uh, if they have a Facebook, if they're probably Instagram, uh, now TikTok is becoming big, Snapchat, world star hip hop, things of that nature. So they're going to post that stuff. Uh, a lot of times people, when they are in, a, in an emotional state, will post something on their Facebook, on their Instagram. Well, she, she deserved it this time, let's say in domestic violence cases. Well, that statement can be used against a perpetrator of domestic violence at criminal trial, because now they're going to have to explain, well, why did you post that then? What did you mean? And if they give sort of, you know, a deceitful answer, well, now I, as a good investigator, as a good co a communicator, has to start poking holes in that, in that deceitful answer. Circumstantial evidence, otherwise known as indirect evidence, it is evidence that makes an inference, does not show, but a reasonable person would infer that the person who has been accused of this offense is actually responsible for the offense. Associative evidence establishes link, linkages between the following, suspects and victims. Did the suspect know the victim? And when we're talking about sexual assault cases, cases like rape, criminal sexual act, uh, an overwhelming majority of those victims know their, uh, their perpetrator. So stranger rape hap happens, but more often than not, most rape victims are acquainted with the person that perpetrated the offense. Suspects with crime scenes, a tool with tool marks, associative, associative evidence is closely tied to Locard's exchange principle. I just sort of referred to that when we're talking about Locard, we're probably talking about uh, trace evidence. Behavioral evidence. Suspect's behavior is often shaped by a combination of several factors, biological factors, environmental factors, things like how they were raised, how do they live? Do they live a low-risk lifestyle? Do they live a high-risk lifestyle? And uh, experiences, each one of these factors can play a role in the crime scene itself because it starts answering that why of Niatwi. Why did the person perpetrate this offense? Involves the psychological state of the offender. The basis of behavioral offense are modus operandi, the motive, and the signature. How did they commit this offense? and also the emotional part that provides satisfaction to the offender. Uh, that's going to be it for this lecture. What I would like you to do is take a look at chapter one and there are some key terms. Please make sure that you can answer all of them. I wish you all a good day and enjoy the rest. Take care, have a good day.